what are they thinking? Why would they do something like that? Wouldn't it be nice to know what's going on on the inside of someone's head and understand just why they do the things that drive you crazy? You're in luck. Welcome to my series on how to get along with people based on their Enneagram type, my favorite personality test that is so incredibly spot on. It's going to blow your mind. Today, my friend and client, Sarah, joins me to share what goes on in the mind of an Enneagram 9. Sarah is a huge sports fan and loves everything Saints. She even manifested her dream job to work for the team and lives in New Orleans. Ready to dive into the mind of a peacemaker? Let's check it out. Well, thank you, Sarah, for coming on the Create Your Fate podcast to enlighten us about Enneagram Nines. Thank you for having me. (laughs) How has knowing you are a nine, how has that helped you actually in just your day-to-day life? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is that it's helped me realize I'm not crazy. Um, There might be instances where I am, but um, I think the biggest thing is like when, especially as an Enneagram Nine, like you're seeking communication and um, consistent community and things like that. And then when you're in those and you find advice, there's a lot of things that could just be like, um, either like take it harsh or, you know, things that work for other people that just don't work for you. And there's a lot of times where I was like, well, what, like there has to be something wrong. Like there has to just be, maybe I'm just mentally not strong enough or, you know, enough is going to come up a lot because of that just being a core part of being an Enneagram nine. And I think that that is what continued to manifest. And then since understanding that I'm an Enneagram nine, it was like, oh, I take things in differently. Like situations are processed completely differently for me. Um, And, you know, I would have family, friends just kind of say, don't worry about it. And I'm like, oh, okay. Love that. I can't do that. I can't not think of something. I can't not analyze every single person or every single situation that I'm in. Um, Or they'll be like, wait, you noticed that? That's weird. And so there'd be a lot of instances where it's like, oh my gosh, am I really that weird? Like, goodness. And then, you know, understanding the Enneagram, it's like, no, I'm not. Like, that's just literally part of who I am. That's my personality. That's like what makes me me versus me trying to conform to what works for other people. Um, And not knowing kind of that this was real and that this was me and that this is my normal. Um, And then it's actually supposed to be celebrated and not, you know, otherwise just kind of put aside sometimes. That's interesting that you bring that up because that's such a huge part of being an Enneagram 9 is being connected to other people. And with that, a lot of times comes conforming to what other people Mm -hmm expect of you. So what has your experience been like with conforming to the expectations of others? Yeah, I would say it's good and bad. Um, I would say it's just like any type of good personality trait that there's some amazing things about it, but then there's some very difficult things about it. Um, I love that I can go into a room and understand just about everybody that's there. Um, and I pride myself on being, I, you know, essentially a safe space or a non-judgmental space because I'm able to put myself in the shoes of everybody around me. And I think that that um, has really, really helped in a lot of ways, but then also is completely hindering because then as an Enneagram 9, there's times where it feels very others focused and um, wanting to keep the peace. And sometimes that's not prioritizing your personal peace, but thinking that your peace is associated with somebody else. And so when you conform to them, you pick up all of their like intricacies and their stresses and their emotions and honestly, their opinions sometimes too. And so there'd be a long time where I didn't really know what I fully like thought about certain certain things in the world. There were things that I just didn't feel like I had a grounding in because I saw every single point of view. Um, And I think that there's a very, very thick and clear boundary that I had to set of like, this is my space and what I think, feel, believe for Sarah. And that's for me, but then it can have facets that relate to every single other person, but it can also not be related to each and every other person. That doesn't mean that they're wrong or that I'm wrong. It just literally means that they're different and that Mm -hmm. I can just see and respect all sides, but seeing and respecting all sides didn't 
mean that I had to conform to all sides. Right, right. The phrase, let's agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. What if somebody disagreed with you? Like, typically Enneagram 9 is like, I cannot agree to disagree. I have to conform and be, you know, I'll agree with what you want. I'm the peacemaker. Mm -hmm. So what does, what does it feel like? Oh, I hate it. Absolutely hate it. I think it used to really honestly make me nauseous of, and it would consume me if I felt, even if I felt like there was a disagreement or some kind of conflict on the horizon, I would, for lack of a better word, like spiral into thinking that all of these things are going wrong. All of these things are going to happen, that they're mad at me, that I did something. Um, And I think it almost got to the point like beforehand where it was like, I don't have an opinion or a worth that's good enough to challenge anybody else Mm. or to think differently than anybody else. And I think sometimes before I really understood everything, peace to me was always less of me and more of them. And so if I were to disagree, that would be me putting too much of me into it and not them. And so I just wouldn't disagree. I would either completely conform, like you said, or honestly, I'll go silent. Um, And both of those things are, they feel comfortable in the moment because it's just kind of appeasing everything. And it's, you know, I'm just going to be in the background and I'm, you know, I usually just want to get through it as quickly as possible. So sometimes agreeing is literally just to speed it up, but um, realizing that it was always, that conflict didn't make me lesser um, that a disagreement with somebody wasn't going to end all be all of the friendship and have this big blow up and everything's going to happen. And even if it did, then that's just kind of life. And I think before going on this journey, like with you and with myself, it was, that felt like life or death. Um, yeah. And I just didn't have my own foothold in my life to even know, like, this is Sarah and this is what she thinks and feels. And it's, clear I think it was everybody around me could be like oh well we know that she's passionate about like x y and z but that's it we don't know anything else it's all just muddied typically nines are very diplomatic people very Mm -hmm. friendly you know everybody loves a nine um they're always (laughs) everybody always loves allegedly no (laughs) uh, allegedly (laughs) nines are very popular um but because they are diplomatic because it's like oh I don't want to stay in this negative energy I hate confrontation. Let's get this back into a positive energy. So what is it about confrontation that you hate? This is going to be very important for people to know how to get along with the nine. They do not like confrontation. Like, why don't, why do you hate confrontation? Mm -hmm. I, so even a little, even part of that, I think almost defining like where we think confrontation exists. It's not, it's not always just sitting down And being like, I have something to say. Here's what I'm going to say. It can literally be us at a restaurant and somebody sasses off to the server. The server sasses off back and that will freak me out. I immediately will be nicer to the server. I will like console a friend, like all of those kinds of things. And so I think any presence of truly negative energy that should not be there is going to stress me out. Um, or is typically based off of some kind of misunderstanding or miscommunication that is just part of the human experience versus like I see war and I see things that are, you know, a different kind of definition of conflict. And then we have ones that like, okay, if I know I'm going into a really tough meeting and I can prepare for it, I'm not going to like it. <laughs> I'm never going to like it because I do not like negative energy. I do not like the simple fact that like Enneagram nines, we pick up on everybody's emotions immediately. It's can be very draining, but because we pick up on everybody's emotions immediately, I immediately know if there's negative energy or if somebody is feeling some kind of way or their body language is doing something different. And then once that energy enters into the space, it enters into my space and I don't like feeling that way. And Mm -hmm. so I think it's almost a, I don't want to see conflict within people. I don't, like seeing that happen anyways but then I also don't like that it immediately affects me I describe Enneagram nines as like a sponge 
right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to take whatever the energy of the room is. I'm going to basically absorb it or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I thought it was, you mentioned that it's exhausting and it can be just like too much. One thing I read about Enneagram nines a lot is it takes an Enneagram nine, a lot of energy just to exist, Mm -hmm. just to be there. And it's not to be said in a negative way. It's just because you hold so much space for everybody in the room. Mm-hmm. Right, because I'm yes. going to make the peace with everyone. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that there's no, um, you know, confrontation mm-hmm. anywhere. Right, even yeah. if it doesn't anywhere, directly involve me, but it does directly involve me because my energy is attached to it. You know, right, right. So, talk to me about um, when you, because a, a common thing for Enneagram nines is. I have to go home and recharge by myself. <laughs> so talk to me about recharging goodness, yes. and why that is just so necessary. Gosh, probably the best analogy is you can't pour from an empty cup. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are a lot of days that I had to learn that pouring out is not always a um, active choice. It is a passive thing that occurs. So me coming to work and working a game or me hosting people or just being around people. I love it. I will continue to love it. Um, but there are days in which it might not feel like that was a lot, but it was a lot. Um, because it's both active and passive pouring out. I think for a lot of people or maybe a lot of other, um, Enneagram types, they can choose in which areas and compartmentalize it. There's really not a lot of compartmentalizing in an Enneagram nine. It's all, going at once. And so it just continues to layer and layer and layer. And it's just a consistent pouring out. And so if I'm on an empty cup and I'm completely on E, I'm not fun to be around. I don't want to be around me. Like I do not (laughs) want that in and of itself is then a conflict of myself. And I think I recharge to ensure that I don't have my own internal conflict because when I do have that internal conflict, I see that it starts to manifest in relationships and other people and I, I pop off or I say things I shouldn't or um, I just have a negative energy around me that was mm-hmm. never – now I'm the one bringing that to the room and I don't like that. And so right. if I'm able to recharge and it's almost as if nothing else is impeding in my space. There's no other energies I can pick up on. I learned that I don't do roommates well. <laughs> literally the next time I have a roommate, (laughs) there's going to be a legal document that says that like our assets split 50, 50, if this contract is breached in a marriage, like that is going to be the next time that somebody else is in my space full time. Truly. I need my space in order to then be out and be as extroverted as I love to be, but I can't just do that all the time. Like I have to, I'm gassed. I have to go home. Yeah. (laughs) Literally, there are I have times to like sit in a room and do nothing. <laughs> right, right. Here's the conflict here in itself is because I'm an Enneagram nine and I'm so energetically connected to others. I like, I like making other people happy. Right. That's mm-hmm. I, I like that. That's a part of my personality. I like, um, and and that can border with people pleasing. Right. But um, because I like that connection with others, FOMO can be really real for an Enneagram oh, yeah. nine. Because that um, that fear of loss and separation, right? Mm-hmm. So, what like it's it's kind of like a twofold question. I, I do want to talk about what that fear of like that loss and separation feels like, but also boundaries with yourself. Because I want to say yes to all these people that I'm literally like energetically connected to. Yes, I want to do this. Yes, I want to do this. Yes, I want to do this. I I want to do that, but I know. And, you know, I have FOMO. It's it's fun. I want to make everyone happy and say yes and be able to show up for all these people that I love. But I mm-hmm. know I'm going to be gassed and be pouring from an empty cup. And so if I don't take that time to go home and recharge, mm-hmm. it's like, how do you find that fine line between FOMO and my cup is drained? Yeah. I think the biggest thing in that was always the people. Um Yes, the activities are fun and all of those kinds of things. But I remember us talking through, like, if I don't say yes to everything at some point, they're not going to be my friend anymore, or I'm not going to get invited to anything anymore. I had to get to the point of understanding that I have to see myself as my own friend. And 
say, okay, if somebody was on the outside looking in and saying, okay, you just had this crazy week, you just did all of these things, you're not feeling well, you haven't been home, you have shows to catch up on, you have food in the refrigerator, like you have all of these things that you know you want to do or you already made a plan for yourself, it would be like canceling on a friend to then go with another friend. And mm-hmm. I would feel awful doing that. If I made a commitment to a friend and they were excited and they put it in their calendar and they got the reminder and everything. And then all of a sudden I was like, Oh, sorry. Like I'm actually going to go over here now. How like heartbreaking that would be for them and how awful I would feel. I now have to make myself that friend of Mm -hmm. no, I made a commitment to Sarah that we are staying home tonight Mm -hmm. and that we're catching Mm -hmm. up on our shows and that this is the night that we're going to make the homemade vodka sauce and get the good bottle of wine and like have ourselves our own date. Like that is a plan now as if I was having a plan with my friend. And I think the biggest thing that I had to learn is that I valued people around me far more than I ever valued myself Mm -hmm. and making the transition of me valuing myself doesn't make me selfish. It's not a bad thing. Even if I, you know, have grown up hearing one way or another that actually me valuing myself and having those moments makes me better for others as well. I know it's very common whenever I coach a nine, it's like, I, I, you always hear, oh, I just want everyone to be happy, right? I'm the peacemaker. I just want to make everybody happy. But uh, you're not including yourself into that everybody. So just right. put yourself, you don't have to put yourself above anybody else on the you know mm-hmm. list of your group of 10 people. But just throw yourself into the mix. Okay, my battery's draining. If you think of like a phone, okay. Mm-hmm. Now I'm like on E. Um, I heard it, I heard it described this, and I thought it was really good. Long fuse, big boom. <laughs> when you reach the yep. end of that, um, Not good. <laughs> yeah. What happens? Yeah. Like what? explain that process of like nope it's okay it's okay it's okay it's okay it's not okay <laughs> really not okay it's really not okay yeah so talk um, to me about the boom <laughs> goodness it can look very very different um mostly kind of depending on where i have prioritized my energy or what is a pinpoint for me during that time um they always say sometimes that like you take out the most on the people that you love the most um And that's definitely true. But then I always take it out on myself first. So I will see myself start to decline of like on that fuse, it goes from like, you feel like you're on top of the world. Like you're doing a good job at work. You're a really good friend. You're a good daughter. Like you're hitting all the marks that you've set for yourself that you want to feel good about at the end of the day. And then all of a sudden, like little things will start happening that make the fuse shorter of like, oh, you forgot this important thing. You forgot that they had a doctor's appointment two hours ago and you didn't check in or, you know, whatever it is. And then somehow that little moment that might be just like a small centimeter on the fuse is going to start sparking all of these other little things that just grow it to the point where every single time that I've had the big bomb explode, which truly is just me like hitting my absolute wall, I will I'm not a crier. I will cry. Mm -hmm. I get very frustrated. And usually whatever that last thing is will be the thing where I'm like, well, this happened. And usually every single person I talk to were like, I can see it in their mind working. They're like, that was it. And I was like, but what you didn't (laughs) see was the massive thing going and leading up to it for days, weeks, however long it is. And then the toughest thing after that big blow up is I'll sit with myself and I start to just kind of criticize myself even more. And then it's all of a sudden like, oh, somebody said this yet again. And I am like, you know, at my boiling point. And they're like, that literally, really? Like, mm-hmm. and so I think in turn, like a lot of people think that nines are incredibly sensitive mm-hmm. because of that. Cause it could literally, you just don't know where on that fuse you're hitting yet. If this is the very beginning and you tell me a joke, you're making fun of me. Cool. I'm good with it. Like, if we're at the very end of the fuse and you make that same joke in the same context and everything. And the only thing that's changed is me not having dealt with the other little things that's going to affect me completely differently. Yeah. And, and someone coming in 
thinking that they're at the beginning of the fuse versus at the end because maybe all these other little incidences were mm-hmm. somebody else, right? Just yeah. happened at the wrong we are at the wrong place at the wrong time, my friend. Yep. You know, like yeah. you caught it at the end of the fuse. So someone in a relationship with a nine, they don't know where they're gonna be, you know, hit on the fuse, right? Mm-hmm. So um one thing about nines is you have that one wing, the perfectionist. Uh, which is a huge part of your personality, which um, because you might typically be, quote unquote, more sensitive or overly sensitive, Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times you can be sensitive to criticism as as ones are. So when somebody comes in and criticizes you, one, they could be at the end of the fuse, right? It's about to boom. Mm -hmm. But how do you, I mean, nobody likes criticism, but what does it really feel like for you? Typically, if I'm getting feedback or criticism, you're telling me something that I have already told myself and figured out. Um, Nines are incredibly self-aware. I know every single move I make. If you're criticizing me on something, I already know it. So having a full lecture to make me feel bad is just going to accelerate feelings that I already have about it. I'm already beating myself up. I'm Mm -hmm. already thinking of ways to do better. And so sometimes it's just that, hey, I recognize that you probably already know that this happened. Here's maybe my perspective as a different person of ways that we can grow and change. Because as a nine, we want to know that. I want to know yeah. all of the routes. I want to know delivery. all the information. Yeah. I want to mm-hmm. know, okay, if if that's how you approach it. Now I know that that's how you would approach it. Maybe I should try it. Or that helps me understand you better and like all these different layers. But if you come in hot and immediately start to criticize it is it can be very 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 Mm -hmm. off-putting because then it's it's eliciting another form of conflict yeah um that was never that then is now I did not feel negative energy or maybe I did feel it and I'm starting to work through it and now you're just adding to it versus saying I understand that there's something here let's work through it um together right together yeah to go back in that like uh, fear of loss and separation, it's like, mm-hmm. hey, if I know you're still on my team, right? Um, nines are in something called the positive outlook group, meaning we deal with, and sevens are too. So two sevens mm-hmm. and nines, um, just tell me everything's going to be okay. Like, yes, we yeah. can we can yeah. um, work on this problem, but like before we even get into the nitty gritty, just tell me that everything's going to be okay and we're, we're going to be together. Oh my you know? gosh. If I know I that like- up front, then oh. I can kind of... <laughs> Yeah. Breathe a little. Yeah. You know, I will walk into like my boss's office or like when my mom is here, I'd be like, am I in trouble? (laughs) Are you okay? Are we okay? Did I do something? If, especially when there's actions that lead to it of like, Hey, pop over for a second. Or like my mom, when she was here last was, Hey, we need to, I need an hour to sit down and talk to you. And I'm like, about what, Mm -hmm. what I did? Am I in trouble? Did I do something wrong? Like tell, like, are we good? Anything that comes after you answering, are we good? I'm going to be much more receptive to yeah. than, and sometimes I need a lot more assurance that we're good. I'm mm-hmm. because there can be just a consistent amount of negative energy. Mm-hmm. I will need a lot more affirmation in times of stress or um, really heightened periods of time or time of change, especially mm-hmm. because yeah. change is a disruption of peace to where it's like, if somebody is saying like, okay, we're moving this way. We're moving this way. Here's all these things that are happening. We're constantly anxious about it. And it's constantly in the back of our heads, but really it is that simple of, Hey, we're good. Like this negative energy that you're feeling, it has nothing to do with you. You're good. Or, Hey, that situation, like, let's talk about it. But like, overall, I'm proud of you, or we're still moving or we're still, you know, those kinds of things makes it feel as if a it's not dire (laughs) and b that it's not the end of the world because any sort of negative confrontational or criticism energy will literally make me feel like it's the end of the world because i'm striving for perfection you're telling me i did something that wasn't perfect how why is it it like it to me that feels massive first of all it's probably not the best to phrase it like that. Like, it's not that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, no, no. Validate my feelings. Affirm my feelings. Give me reassurance Correct. that we're okay. Mm-hmm. And also, like, of my feelings. Um, yeah. Words of affirmation is probably very important. I hear that a lot with Enneagram Nines. It's like, mm-hmm. just tell me something, right? Give me yeah. some type of validation and 
an affirmation, even if mm-hmm. it's to another type, especially more of the more direct, less communicative, like fluff words um, types, right? Like yep. so, um, ones, fives, eights. It's like no, no, no. I want the fluff, right? Give me the fluff. Yeah, fluff you know? it for me. Fluff it. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> I, I literally the, the idea. Like, give. I want all the fluff always. Like, I want. Yeah the bow on the present I want you know like I and I think it's also it like leads to like intentionality there's times where it's like if you're gonna if you cared enough at some point to give me some sort of feedback you care in which that feedback is going to be delivered to me that's effective Mm -hmm. and it's going to help me if you're just screaming at me to scream at me or whatever it is I'm not gonna take that well Mm -hmm. Um, or you're going to just continue to think that I'm sensitive or that like, I don't let go of things or whatever it is where truly it's just, if you take an intentional time with me, that's all I ever really ask for. And I think it's because we're so intentional. If I'm willing to sit with you and talk through every single thing for hours upon hours, I love doing that. I want to continue to do that. But if I'm not given the same regard for something small in return, not that it's ever tit for tat, but just the simple fact of like, I feel like you could have been a lot more intentional. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you show up so hard for others. Mm -hmm. It's like, and one thing I heard of read somewhere at some point in time. um, One thing I know about Enneagram nines is it's really important for you to be intentional, even about compliments, you know, like little tiny things. Yeah. Be very specific in compliments that are directly towards you Mm -hmm. because most of my, you know, energy can be connected to others, right? Mm -hmm. I picture like little energetic cords connecting to everybody that when you specifically compliment me and it's something that you highly noticed, right? Like, Mm -hmm. oh, you got your haircut. It's like, wow, that means so much to me because you noticed me, right? Mm -hmm. And, And get very specific in it. Yeah. Um. Another phrase, another piece of communication advice that had uh, that I've used a lot with nines is because nines are the peacemakers, right? And they they want to keep the peace with everybody. Sometimes they can get bulldozed in conversation, where in certain types, especially, can come in where I'm gonna I'm gonna create a scenario here, and you tell me your experience with it. We're in a a one-on-one conversation. I ask you where you want to eat. And you, I always describe it this way. If there's 10 people there, I literally have to like disconnect my little energetic cords from everyone, figure out like where I want to eat. And then I reconnect Mm -hmm. all the cords to everybody. Like, would this person want this? Would this person want this? Would this person want this? All the things. And maybe that's like a, you know, five second lull in conversation Mm -hmm. where you're actually thinking about it. Because one of the best pieces of advice I I read was, um, listen to what I have to say, even though I might meander a bit. Mm -hmm. Because you're processing all this information. But if someone does not like awkward silences or or pauses, they might just be like, where do you want to go to eat? Oh, we're going to Chili's. You know? Yeah. It's like, wait, I didn't even, like, you never told me what, you know? You didn't give me a chance. Mm -hmm. I think that... Exactly that. And it's something to where it's like, just if you're asking me something, let me process it. Give me the little bit of space. I'm not going to take forever, but I am going to really be intentional with a lot of the actions that I do and that I take. And that might be, and it is different than others. That's good to know. And and give you time Mm -hmm. and space to just process because, you know, on that integration to a, an Enneagram six in times of stress, there's can be a lot of overthinking, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, and with that then comes a lot of over processing. So it's like, mm-hmm. there's a lot of thoughts going on in the mind of an Enneagram nine at all mm-hmm. times. And at so, literally all times. Yeah. <laughs> just, um, yeah, there's one takeaway for people to, to get from this podcast. I, yep. I, it might be that there's just a lot. It going might just on be there. that. Yeah. So, I yeah. think another facet of that too is, <laughs> If something is happening in the moment, I will usually go like very, very calm and not really process a lot of what's going on around me because it's about these other people. I need to make sure that they're good and that they're good and that this conflict is taken care of and that 
we're approaching this well and that we like completely disarm whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It might take me 30 minutes, an hour, a day to really process the event that occurred. Mm -hmm. And then usually the other person is probably already over it, not really thinking about it. And then I'm the one coming up from the side that's like, hey, wait, now, hold on. I've processed this. I don't, I don't like this, but then it sometimes to other types, it can feel as if I'm just bringing something up or I'm harboring Mm -hmm. emotions or that I'm holding a grudge when a lot of times it's truly, we just didn't process it fully. Well, thank you for that insane insight. I think that has shed a lot of light on what goes on on the inside of a nine because on the outside it can present as just like, no, everything's happy. I'm positive and let's just... Mm -hmm you know, do what's best for the group. But there's a lot of depth to an Enneagram 9. And so thank you for giving us um, some insight into the complexity of the mind. Um, If there was any one last piece of advice that you wanted to give people to get along with Enneagram 9s, any any last final thoughts? I think the best thing you can do is create a safe space for us in the same way that we try to create safe spaces for others, mm-hmm. but understanding what that safe space looks like um, and communicating to us, if you can't provide that, that that is okay. Um, that it is not going to be any difference to me in how I view you and how I continue to love you or care for you or am intentional with you. If anything, something that would that kills me is if I feel as if I'm burdening somebody else with something. And in the beginning, I would have loved to just be like, Hey, like, I love you. I just, I can't do this today. Or can we talk about this another time? I think we will continue to adjust, but if it feels as if we're bothering or taking up a space that we shouldn't or causing another negative emotion in somebody, that's going to really affect us. And so I think, the preemptive communication that maybe I don't give all that much because most of the time I'm ready at any point to have a very serious and intentional conversation and probably force it onto others more than I should. But I think on the flip side of that, of knowing that we care very deeply about relationships and people and energies, I love listening to people and I try to do it to the best of my ability in a way that shows up for them. And because of that, I don't like to talk a lot myself. But if it feels as if I was given some space to decompress, to talk, to get my cup refilled, and I don't feel like you're listening to me at all, that is one of the deepest, like, hurts, I think, that right. could immediately happen. And it, um, it happens a lot. During listening. Like, can you get off the oh, phone? Like, please put your phone out. You know? Right, right. It takes us a lot to open up and to talk about our own energies and emotions the second we're vulnerable with somebody that it creates a different bond with them to where we feel as if if that's taken advantage of or not appreciated by the other person or not cherished by the other person um as I would try to cherish their energies like it I I'm not well with it <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm gonna shut down oh yes the yeah. um, beloved Enneagram wing eight coming in with the, um, wait a minute, I was vulnerable with you and now you are not handling that with care. Let me, mm-hmm. let me, you know what? I'm going to take that back, you know, and guess what? Yep. You're probably not going to get this again, but. Correct. Um, yeah. It's almost like you unintentionally are punishing them from having mm-hmm. access to you in the future. And we frame it around like, okay, well now I feel like you no longer have access to me if I didn't feel safe in the access that I gave you before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that I know is a big growth point for nines too, is how that can, if left, we'll say untreated, it can turn into some passive aggressive behaviors. And oh, yeah. 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 Well, thank you for that deep insight. I think of that course. was super helpful. So yes. thank you. Of course. Thank you. That wraps up 
how to get along with an Enneagram 9. I hope it was helpful and gave you some insight into the mind of somebody who you love. To listen to the entire episode, along with more episodes on Enneagram 9s, check out my podcast that's streaming on all major platforms. It's linked right in the bio. Be sure to send it to your favorite Enneagram 9 or someone who you know is in a close relationship with a 9. And if you loved today's episode, please follow, subscribe, leave a review. It really does help the show grow so much and allows me to continue to get awesome guests and episodes out for you. And of course, if I could leave you with just one thing, it is this. Expect good things always and they will happen. Thank you.